First, a congratulations to everyone for winning question one on November 8th. It's an amazing victory. It took 107 years, but it's the people in this room that did it and made possible for us to ask the very wealthiest to pay a little more so that we can finally have public higher education that's high quality, debt free. We also invest in our public pre-K-12 schools and our roads, bridges, and public transportation. But we're here today specifically to talk about the need, finally, to reinvest in public higher education. And I think I'll point you all to um, the Boston Globe this morning, which talked about how question one must be needed, must be spent in part on making high quality, debt free public higher education, and that public higher education has long been under supported. All of you in this room know that very well. So this is our moment. This is our chance, and I'm really, really excited to be, to be here doing this. Let me first quickly acknowledge a few people. First, as I said, I want to recognize our staff and faculty and students here, the bedrock of our higher ed institutions. We also have um, Senator Comerford, who you'll hear from later, and Senator Eldridge, and Rep. Natalie Higgins, um, authors and key sponsors of our core um, bills that you'll be hearing about. Um, Rep. Paul Donato, I think, is not here, but was here before and really wanted to support this effort. Um, Senator Pacheco, thank you for being here as well. Um, and Rep. Gentile, nice to see you first in person for the first time in many, many years. I also really want to acknowledge our, our partners in the state universities, Vincent Padoni, um, in the community colleges, Nate McKinnon, and also at the UMass system, David McDermott. And I think what's exciting is it feels like we are all rowing in the same direction, and that the four principles you're going to hear about today from these great speakers here are ones that we all share. Affordable, accessible public higher education, student supports, investing in fair pay and benefits and retention of our great staff and faculty, including our exploited adjuncts, need better treatment, fair treatment, and then finally building healthy, green, public college and university buildings that are paid for by the Commonwealth, by us all together, and not dumped on students and their families as further student debt. So let me just say one, tell you one little story that animates me. Um, you, some of you know, I, when I'm not doing the job as president of the MTA, I teach architecture at UMass Amherst. And for many years, I worked out of the Fine Arts Center building at UMass Amherst. If you've ever been there, it's the, the I will be a neutral description, a very large concrete building at the entrance <laughs> of campus. For many years, studying architecture, I came to hate that building. I grew up in Amherst. My dad taught at UMass, and I saw it rise up, and the tallest library in the world rise up. And I used to, um, you know, I came to say, like, oh, I don't like this kind of building, like Boston City Hall and the like. I'll tell you why it came to be beautiful to me. Because when they built that in 1974, they completed it in 1974, it was the largest arts complex west of Boston in all of New England, right? They built it at the, st the gateway to the campus, was built for working class students who could go debt free to UMass Amherst all the way through the 1980s if they worked a 10 hour work minimum wage job. And they took this arts complex, they took 646 feet of art studio space, and they lifted it up on four pedestals as the gateway to the campus. What a statement that was about the investment in public higher education and in, in our students. That's the kind of transformative investment we are wanting, so that we have outstanding facilities, the best facilities for public the, the public and our students in the Commonwealth, that they do, do go to those campuses debt free, that there's sufficient faculty and staff, fairly paid, well paid, in order to provide the best education possible. We did something like that before. We can do that again, and that's what we need. And almost as if it were scripted, but it was not, students from Michelle Dunn's class, fifth grade, welcome future <laughs> citizen <laughs> students. <laughs> of public higher ed are walking in the door at this moment. <laughs> Michelle Dunn, give a quick wave. One of our members from the Cape, Michelle, give a wave so we know you're there, um, brought, was already bringing her students here for a tour of our glorious state house that has reopened. And so they are here to see some democracy in action, and they are our future students. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you here. <laughs> and that's Deb McCarthy, Vice President of the MTA. <laughs> 
Excellent. It's great that you're here. Okay, so then let me get off the stage, and I'm going to turn it over to Annetta Argyris, the professional staff union at UMass Boston, who will be our MC for today. Thank you, Max. Good morning, everybody. Um, it is really great to be here with you today on this ex in this exciting moment for Massachusetts when we have now voted through yes on one, and we can move forward and visualize what is the Commonwealth we want to build with those added resources. So I want to take a moment to orient us all to what we're talking about when we contemplate public higher education in Massachusetts. When we talk about public higher education, we're talking about an educational system that encompasses the community colleges, state universities, and UMass. All told, we have campuses in over 40 communities in Massachusetts. We employ over 50,000 workers, the vast majority of whom live here and vote here. And we enroll over 185,000 students every year. It is a huge system. And it's safe to say that investments in public higher education affect people in every single community in this commonwealth. We keep hearing in the media that the need for higher education is shrinking as a result of changing demographics in Massachusetts and in the United States. And while this analysis might apply to private institutions, and indeed we're seeing many of them struggle to attract students, it is the wrong way to think about public higher education. Indeed, the thinking's backwards. We should instead be thinking about the tens of thousands of students who graduate from high school in Massachusetts each year but don't enroll in college because they can't afford it or because they face other daunting barriers. We should be thinking about the over 700,000 adults in our Commonwealth who have started college but never graduated. These potential college students and graduates are disproportionately people of color. We see that the percentage of high school students um, that identify students of color um, has grown in Massachusetts, and the percentage of each group with a bachelor's degree or higher is lower uh, for black students and Hispanic and Latino students than it is for our white students. These are the folks we need to be reaching and we need to be educating. The potential college students and graduate students, in addition to mostly being students of color, are disproportionately low income, and many of them would be what we call first-gen students, the first people in their families ever to attend college. They are the members of our commonwealth who our public education system should be focused on serving. And to do that, we know how to do this, right? as they say, this isn't brain science or brain surgery, we need to remove the barriers that are preventing these first-gen BIPOC and low-income students from getting that essential college degree that they need to be successful in our modern economy. We need to make college affordable, and we need to ensure that the supports are in place to ensure that each of these students can succeed in college. Doing so would dramatically expand opportunities in our communities and create a much more equitable and prosperous future for our entire commonwealth. So what you're going to hear about this morning are four steps, four things that we need to tackle to make that bold vi vision of deepening the access to public education for all in Massachusetts a reality. You're going to hear about how we need to recruit and retain highly qualified faculty and staff, how we need to increase student support, how we need to ensure that public college is affordable and accessible for all, and how we need to invest in long-term and sustainable campus infrastructure. To get us started, I'm going to invite up Claire Sheedy. Claire is a student at UMass Amherst, and she's going to talk about the need to increase student supports. Welcome, Claire. Good morning, everyone. What does it mean to be revolutionary? The University of Massachusetts Amherst has spent, I assume, thousands of dollars on a Be Revolutionary campaign, which is plastered across campus because they know UMass is home to many aspiring leaders. My name is Claire Sheedy. 
I'm a senior public health and women's gender and sexuality studies double major, completing the five college reproductive health, rights, and justice certificate, and recently began my accelerated master's in public health. I'm also the speaker of the Student Government Association. As I reflect on my undergraduate career, I want to re reiterate to you all one key component of student success, mentors. Whether it's sitting on numerous committees and councils or working on policy, I am involved as much as possible on campus. But it wasn't always that way. I came into UMass in 2019 as a freshly turned 18 year old who lacked self-confidence. In 2020, when the world shifted following the COVID-19 pandemic, I felt closer to, than ever to my former advisor, Karen Letterly. Having her as an advisor was life changing for me. Not only did she support me on an academic level, but she was a mentor for me during some of the hardest years of my life. The first semester I came to UMass Amherst, I was sexually assaulted. And although it consumed me for months, it was something I failed to disclose to almost anyone. Trauma takes on many forms, and for me, I faced a silent battle for months before diving headfirst into my academics. When I sought direction on my academics, I walked into Karen Letterly's office, and we had a pivotal conversation that led to fruitful growth and change in both my academic pursuits and my personal life. Three years later, this past April, I gave a TED Talk in front of hundreds of people about sexual violence. That would not have been possible without my studies and my former advisor. The experiences, opportunities, and mentorship that I've had at UMass made me realize the true disservice being done by all universities who neglect to provide students with full-time academic advisors. Now, I am just one of many students explaining one story of my obstacles that I faced while in college. Students in marginalized communities face innumerable barriers students like me do not have to face receiving their education, thus confirming the necessity of diverse advisors in addition to making public education accessible to all, which includes fostering an inclusive and welcoming environment for staff and faculty of all backgrounds. It's crucial that students see themselves and their professors, their advisors, and all staff at all universities, whether it's Massachusetts or elsewhere. I was once told that radical vulnerability is the key to solving many of today's issues. So let's all be radically vulnerable today and commit to a future where barriers are lifted so all students can truly be revolutionary. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Massachusetts Community College Council represents all of the faculty and professional staff at all 15 of the state community colleges. Um, I personally am a faculty member at Cape Cod Community College. Massachusetts Community Colleges, our faculty, staff, and students suffer from chronic underfunding. We are experiencing a hiring and retention crisis, and the solution is to bring our wages and workloads into the 21st century. Our average full professor salary is about $75,000, which may not seem bad, but our average instructor salary is about $57,000. And these averages not only fail to keep up with the costs of living, but are in fact declining. Our starting full-time salaries for faculty are $47,000, and for professional staff, a little over $42,000. We have failed searches on every one of our 15 campuses. We have search procedures. We get candidates that we would like to hire, and as soon as they find out how much money they're going to make and how much it's going to cost to live here, they decline. And in some cases, there are repeated searches, and the repeated searches also fail driving vacancies across the system, which is bad for other faculty and professional staff, and it's horrible for our students. These problems making it, make it increasingly difficult to also diversify our faculty and staff. And most of our members have second jobs to cover costs. I myself, when I took the job, given how many student loans I had, I worked for 11 years as a bartender four nights a week with a full-time job. Uh, it, that is what we live with. Where I live on the Cape, the median home price this October was $895,000. The average rent, 2,966. Add in student loan payments, and it doesn't take a math professor to figure this problem out. 
we can't hire people. And if we don't just have a problem hiring people, we also have a problem losing valuable faculty and professional staff mid-career to jobs at other colleges or in the private sector where they can earn more money. Our workloads are also not commensurate with our wages. We teach five courses each semester, do academic advising, and have college service responsibilities, and professional staff workloads are exploding from advising to counseling, from financial aid to librarians. And all of this is compounded by a lack of support, increasing student needs, the impact of COVID, and the college's inability, and in some cases, unwillingness to fill vacant positions because of fiscal concerns. We teach and serve about half of Massachusetts public higher ed students, yet we receive approximately 25% of the state's higher ed budget. Our students are more diverse, are more financially challenged. We have more first generation college students and more students who are not as prepared for college as they could be. We need diverse and highly qualified faculty and professional staff to meet the needs of our students and ensure that students, especially our students of color, have the best opportunities possible to graduate. We need to stop our exploitation of contingent faculty and professional staff by creating more full-time positions and not resting college budgets on their labor. We owe this to our students and we owe this to all of our state employees. We have an opportunity to change the way we fund and support higher education. Let us seize this opportunity now and together. Thank you. Thank you, Claudine. There are some specific concrete steps that the legislature can take in order to address and fix the problems that Claudine just described for us. Um, one, adjust the salaries to account for the loss um, of, to inflation over the past three years. Our wages have not kept up with the cost of living. Uh, two, reform the financing of benefits um, so that the state funds the health insurance and pensions and related costs for all of our faculty and staff. This will free up tens of thousands of dollars on each of our campuses so that we can better attract and retain the high quality quality faculty and staff that we need. And thirdly, we need the Commonwealth to work with us to conduct an equity study to examine and implement changes to workloads and salaries. We need to ensure that there are enough full-time faculty and staff to provide reasonable workloads and teaching loads so that they can provide all students with the support they need. And we need to address wages and benefit inequities. There are profound inequities within our system. These need to be fixed. So three steps um, that we need folks to take. Um, one specific subgroup of our uh, employees within the UMass system who will face deep inequity um, are adjunct faculty. And we'll now be hearing from Phyllis Keenan from Greenfield Community College to talk about the specific plight that our adjunct faculty face. Thank you, Phyllis. <laughs> Hello, I teach the developmental math courses generally or other entry level math courses. So these are courses that people take when they have a lot of anxiety about math and really struggle with math. So the other population you need to know that's in this group are most of these students are first semester students. So as an adjunct faculty, I'm their first professor. I am the first one that they're interacting with. And most of the students come in, they have anxiety, they've struggled with math, but by the time I get them through the first month, they're smiling when they walk in the door. They're talking to the people at their table they're working at, and they're feeling confident because they're competent in math. They have changed the way they look at learning for them. They have changed their story about themselves. A, a, a short story I want to tell you is about one student who's in that category. And she was a first generation college student. After she finished that semester, the next semester, her mother took my class. Her mother had been so inspired by her daughter that she got her high school equivalency while her daughter was in her first semester at the community college. And then the following semester, I had her father in my class. <laughs> and he too had been inspired by his daughter's change in the way she looked at the world. She looked at the world as somebody who could achieve her goal. 
So he then believed he could and got his high school equivalency and then went on to community college. This is how we change families. This is how we change communities. Community colleges are so important. And as adjunct faculty, we teach more than half the classes at these community colleges across the state and at four-year colleges. For many students, we are the first faculty that they see. It's so important that we have a way to be able to tell the students, yes, I will be teaching next semester. The job security that we're looking for, because as the student I just spoke about, her mother came because she, her daughter had had success with me as a faculty. Now there's many other faculty who are really great teachers where I teach and at other places. The student made the connection with me and I was able to launch that student onto other classes. So we need to have that job security, that continuity from semester to semester and we need better pay. And many of the adjunct faculty work at the same college year after year. The survey that we did in the summer found that more than 80% have worked at their college for over six years. So we have a semester by semester contract. Right now, I don't know what I'm teaching in the spring. Students ask me, could I take this course with you next? I can't tell them because I don't know if I'm teaching it. I don't know who's teaching it because they're waiting for enrollment to go up. Well, you know, some students will only take a class if they know who's teaching it. And, you know, professor staff doesn't cut it for most students. <laughs> so we're also looking for a real retirement that the state contributes to because we don't have that either. We also don't have health care other unless we can get it through the state health care program, which has universal health care. Or if, or if people work at other jobs. So I want you to just think about how we change lives in community college, how we as adjunct faculty are very important. And I ask you to increase our pay, our job security, to provide us health care and a real retirement. Because we change lives, we change families, and we change communities. The importance of ensuring equitable and adequate salaries and benefits for our adjunct faculty cannot be overstated. We are doing a disservice to our students and endangering the health of our adjunct faculty when they are forced to work on multiple campuses just to make ends meet. And Phyllis's story helped really bring that to life. Thank you. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Beth Contos, president of the AFT Massachusetts, to speak about the need for affordable and accessible public college for all. Welcome back. Thank you so much. I want to go back in time a little bit. First of all, let me tell you that I represent UMass Dartmouth faculty, staff, um, and maintainers. We also represent K through 12 throughout the state, public librarians, healthcare, and um, uh, private higher ed. Okay, we have quite a few schools. Um, I am a social studies teacher from Salem High School. I'm on leave as I serve as president, and I also serve, uh, worked as an adjunct at North Shore Community College for, for several years. I absolutely love community college work. Um, it feels like a place of first chances, but also a place of second chances for so many. I want to go back in time, and I want to tell you a story about a woman named Coco. I come from a long line of women who live a very long time which is good. As I age, I'm very happy that I see another 50 years ahead of me. But um, my grandmother, um, you know, in her late 80s, she had a visiting nurse named Coco, and I was a little girl. And Coco told me she needed to have a job that supported her family. She had been a death in her family, needed to get back into the workforce while her children were very young. Salem State College had a wonderful um, RN program. She went, she was able to go while her students were in school, and she gave back to the community. She talked to me, um, and I was probably 10. She talked to me about how it didn't cost very much, 
and she had a really good job that she valued afterwards. And she felt she was giving back to the community. And I'll tell you, she did give back to the community because my grandmother lived in her home until her very last day. And, oh, I'm gonna crap. <laughs> and so much of that was because of the service of the visit. Okay, I always cry, I'm so sorry, I'm such a crier. <laughs> but the visiting nurses that came to her home, and, and the, the same with my grandfather, but I was particularly close to my grandmother. And um, I remember being in the car, driving with my mother, asking about why do people pay for school? I thought school was free. I go to the public school, I never heard about tuition. And she explained to me, and she used terms without saying common good, but that's what she was explaining to me, that the entire state of Massachusetts paid a little bit of their taxes so that Coco could go to school, serve my grandmother, and also serve her children well by being able to support them. And that stuck with me. And um, we loved Salem State in my family because they had a really good hockey team in the <laughs> 70s. And we would go to the hockey games, and it was rowdy, and they were the Vikings, and they had Viking hats, and it was crazy, and my father said to me, you will never go to this school. Is that clear? <laughs> well, I went to that school. <laughs> and Salem State was affordable for me, um, you know, probably uh, 10 or 12 years after this conversation with Coco. And when I graduated, and you know, I'll t I tell the story all the time, $250 a semester, is really affordable. It was affordable then. I made all, my family didn't pay, contribute to my college. I paid for it all. I had a summer school, a summer job, and I was able to earn my tuition and living expenses, and that's the way it should be. We're talking about public higher ed. I became a double Viking when I got my master's, but to go into a public service career we should be funding that. All of us should be funding it. I know it's shifted so much in the last 40 years about how we fund, and way more of our tuition and fees is put upon our students rather than all of us who benefit. And my mother explained to me that everybody pays a little and everyone benefits a lot. Um, so I want us to think about that as we go forward. So many of my colleagues are graduates of the UMass system, of the college system, the university system here in Massachusetts. We should be able to graduate debt-free or as close to it as possible. It is a worthwhile investment in our, in our I was gonna say young adults. Not everybody's young that goes to college, but, and I, I gotta say, for all the Claire's of the world, we need to make this investment. For all those kids who came through here a few minutes ago, we need to make this investment. It is the only reason why we continue to do this work. So thank you for being here. We're gonna spend that billion in a good way. Thank you, Beth. I am sure everybody in this room has seen many graphs um, in recent years about the decrease of our investment in public higher education in Massachusetts. But we wanted to share these two images that really focus in on what the impacts of that reduced investment has on student and student debt. So on the left-hand side, you'll see that state funding in, in the 10-year period from 2001, well, 20-year period from 2001 to 2020, um, state funding has decreased by about $2,500 per student. And as a result of that, the increase of tuition and fees has been enormous, um, up by about $6,500 per student. What this means is that students are taking on more and more debt. So as a result of that, now for our public institutions in that same 20-year period, students have seen their debt increase by over $12,000. And we know that the share of that debt is not distributed equally across all segments of our society, all segments of our community. African American students take on the lion's share of this debt. This is an enormous barrier that we can get rid of. So this is one of the first things we have to do. We have to ensure that uh, we can fix this problem of underfunding in our public institutions uh, by 
and underfunding financial aid for our students um, by funding and implementing a debt-free college plan so students can have their living expenses as well as their tuition and fees covered. Students need to be able to eat and live if they're going to be able to study and learn. And the good news is that by passing Yes on One and the Fair Share Amendment, we now have the money to make that debt-free higher education a reality in Massachusetts. And to get back to the, the golden memories that Beth was reminding us of, of when this really was a benefit for everybody. That's where we need to go back to. So we have one last speaker from out from within um, the university system before we talk, before we hear from some of our other stakeholders. So I'm gonna invite up Joanna Gonzalez, who's the faculty at um, Salem State University to talk about our fourth priority, which is to invest in long-term and sustainable infrastructure for our campuses. Thank you, Sanana. I'm gonna be talking about something that may, most people don't know about, which is campus debt, um, but also to talk about our building needs. More than half of the buildings on our 29 campuses were built in the 1950s and 1960s. Now, 60 years later, right, there's much need for modernization and improvement, and frankly, some buildings need to be completely replaced. Um, and the pandemic really exposed uh, the problems with these buildings, especially in terms of poor air quality. Um, we need new HVAC systems, um, improving ventilation, uh, temperature control, humidity control would really help our students be able to learn better within those environments and it would support the well-being of our campus employees. We really need some strategic upfront costs, right, to invest in our build buildings and um, we need healthy technologies in green, you know, green technologies so that we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, right, on our campuses, but also in the long term, reap the benefits of um, energy savings. So I want to give you a concrete example of what's wrong with campus facilities in Massachusetts. So I teach at Salem State. I've been there since 1998, and we have, a, I gotta put a plug, exceptional programs, and you know, the health and biological sciences, great theater program, great hockey team still, <laughs> yeah, among very many other programs. Um, but our main building for arts and sciences, Meyer Hall, which was built in 1964, hasn't been modernized at all. You should see our labs. They're worse than most middle school. Middle school labs are much better than what we have. Um, and we also have some serious HVAC problems in that building. And in the spring, they had to shut the building down in the middle of the semester because a great crack between the two wings popped off tiles and, 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 and created problems. So we had to go remote. Um, our campus presidents, the current one, President Keenan and President Maservi before, had been repeatedly submitting proposals to the Commonwealth to improve this facility but other important capital projects, and we kept getting rejected because DCAM, who uh, reviews these proposals, said it was just too expensive. <laughs> Luckily, um, in the spring, we got an approved proposal that includes new wet labs in, in Meyer Hall, much needed, um, which is great news. We're celebrating it. However, the cost of construction is only going to be funded 50% by the Commonwealth. The rest of the, the funding for that needs to come from the campus. We're going to use up some rever reserves. We don't have deep reserves. We might have to do some borrowing. We may have to raise student fees. Right now, President Keenan's out pounding the pavement, right, looking for, for fund, you know, fundraising, looking for donations so that we can do this project. It shouldn't be this way. Um, unfortunately, for the past few decades, support for capital projects across our campuses has not kept pace with the growing backlog of deferred maintenance. Um, you see, in response to this situation, our campus leaders have increasingly turned to borrowing to make up the difference in the, uh, the underfunding. And students are paying the price for the, the cost of campus buildings, maintenance, including academic buildings and auxiliary services. To give you a sense of the magnitude of the problem, the UMass system has $3 billion in outstanding capital debt. The Massachusetts State Colleges have $1.2 billion in outstanding debt. Our community colleges have a billion and deferred maintenance projects just aren't getting done. On average, 
Students at Massachusetts State Colleges and UMass pay over $2,500 a year, a year, just for their campuses building debt. There was a time when the Commonwealth picked up 100% of the costs of important capital improvements and didn't jeopardize the campus's finances nor put students in debt. Our students deserve healthy and modern campus facilities paid for by the state and not through student fees. The Commonwealth owns the land and the buildings on these campuses and has a responsibility to take care of them. Thank you. Joanna, um, this is often a hidden cost within our campuses and our campus budgets. I'll say that I looked into this issue at my UMass Boston campus a number of years ago, and we are paying probably upwards of 25 to 30 million dollars a year coming out of our annual budget just to deal with interest, debt, and depreciation. That is stealing money from our students, increasing their debt burden, and it is being done on the backs of underpaid and understaffed classrooms. Um, so we, we need this turned around. So and again, two solutions to fix the kind of images that you're seeing up there on the screen. We need to return, as Joanna said, to the model of public funding for public buildings on our, on our public campuses so that we can have safe and healthy learning and working conditions, and so that we can help the state meet its climate mitigation goals. Without the costs of this maintenance um, and construction being passed on to student in the form of additional fees, tuition, and ultimately student debt. And we need to include faculty and staff when assessing the campus needs to make sure that what is being invested in actually addresses the need concerns that will most directly improve those learning and working conditions for our students. So while it may feel like this is a lot of stuff for us all to do, we believe all of this can be accomplished if we put our public funds where our public priorities are. And that's what we all, I believe, want to see happen um, in the Commonwealth. To end out our session this morning, we're going to invite up some of our stakeholders who don't work directly or study directly at these institutions. We are building a coalition of, building, of business and civic leaders um, who care about what happens in our public higher education institutions. And Greg Bielecki is here with us today to come up and speak. Um, Greg is the principal at Redgate and was our former Secretary of Housing and Economic Development in Massachusetts. Come on up, Greg. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to be here. I, uh, so I want to talk about a lot of good reasons why public higher education is so important so, to so many people in the state. I want to focus just for a couple minutes on the importance of public higher ed to our business community. I think if you brought 100 business people in Massachusetts in a room and you asked them the question, why do you choose to have a business in Massachusetts, grow your business in Massachusetts, uh, 100 of 100 would say it's because of the talented workforce that's here. That is our distinctive competitive advantage. Really, there's no debate about that. You will hear some people say, however, uh, well, gee, we have a lot of uh, private colleges and universities here, uh, why is public higher ed so important? And I think there's a lot of reasons why it's important to the business community, but I'm just going to give you two quickly here this morning. One is, in our modern innovation economy that we have here, yes, we have the need for very highly educated people, but we also have a massive need uh, for well-educated people who fall somewhere between uh, a high school diploma in a full four-year degree. There's literally hundreds of thousands of good jobs in a variety of industries, healthcare, manufacturing, construction, that fall in that middle range. And if you look, honestly, our private colleges and universities have paid very little attention uh, to that uh, segment, which isn't like a niche. It's literally hundreds of thousands of people uh, who need that kind of uh, uh, education and support. And You've heard some of the stories, but our, our, it's really our public education here, our community colleges, state colleges, and universities that do such a tremendous job of understanding that issue and focusing on the issue. Uh, it requires, as Phyllis talked about, meeting people 
where they are. A lot of, the, um, a lot of these uh, young people uh, completed their education or maybe thought they did in high school and then joined the workforce and then realized in order to get the good job or the kind of job they wanted, uh, they needed uh, more education uh, and are coming back. And it's really uh, public higher ed that's been the champion uh, of those students and the support for those students uh, for many years here. And we need that to continue uh, to have a successful economy and to meet the needs of our employers. The second uh, reason I want to mention is if you look at our innovation economy, as uh, we used to call Governor Patrick and I used to call it, but focus very heavily on science, technology, and medicine. Uh, and it's terrific uh, that we have such a strong innovation economy here, but it's a huge challenge that it's so disproportionately concentrated in Boston and Cambridge. And the benefits of that economy and those jobs have not really spread around the state. And so when you look at the UMass system, and what's happening in Lowell and in Worcester and in Amherst. Uh, not only are they training uh, young people for jobs in the innovation economy, they're helping them start businesses and incubate businesses. They're collaborating with local companies on research. They're bringing in a lot of federal research dollars. So they've done an amazing job of uh, helping us to extend our innovation economy and all the benefits of that all across the state. Finally, I just want to... Uh, point out that in terms of where, where we are in thinking about public higher ed and, and the importance on the agenda, you know, a lot of, if you talk to business people here uh, who's, uh, and ask them, well, where else uh, do you hear about or do you think about as being a great place to do business? Often you'll hear Virginia mentioned, you'll hear North Carolina mentioned, you'll hear Texas mentioned. And if you listen to the governors of any of those states talk about why people should do business in those states, if you listen to those governors talk for more than five minutes, they will always talk about the great public higher education system they have in those states and how that is training the workforce uh, that employers need to be there. So that would be a great vision, I think, for us to have is to say, let's uh, make an effort on, on, these, uh, on this initiative to a point where when we're talking about why Massachusetts is a great place to do business, higher education is right at the top of the list. Thank you. We have right now the moment. This is the moment. We have the money because of question one, because of the great work by MTA, AFT, SAU, and many other stakeholders to pass the millionaire's tax to fund education. Let's make sure, as many people have been saying, including the Boston Globe today, let's make sure that a serious investment, a transformational investment, is in public higher education. The second thing, <laughs> the second thing as has been laid out just now, is we have the need. We've shown the need, whether you're talking about wages, whether you're talking about making sure that we reach equity in all areas, whether geographically or from an economic or, or racial gap perspective, um, we, we see the need. And the, the third area uh, is that we have the political will. We have the political will here. We have union leaders, we have business leaders here, student and faculty voices um, who are calling out for transformational change. And so um, I am feeling so inspired about this. This is the perfect moment to send a message to House and Senate leadership, to our next governor, um, that we need to make sure that as this money comes in out of the millionaire's tax, that we're committing that to public higher education. And what I want to say is, in addition to the three things that were the, the things that were already highlighted for why we need to take action now, one of the things I'm thinking about, especially this election season, is what is the impact of public higher education? What is the value of people becoming more educated? And I would say, first of all, at a moment in our nation's history where it's arguably the largest attacks on our democracy, on us being a democracy, we know that when people get more educated, when they interact with people from different walks of life, um, they come together, we come together more as a commonwealth, as a country. So that is a powerful reason to invest in public higher education. We have one of the strongest and most robust and diverse economies, but what we know is that there are serious gaps. Um, as a legislator, uh, and I think all legislators can speak to this, is that there isn't a day that goes by when we hear about labor and workforce challenges across Massachusetts. And the last thing 
uh, is, is around um, making sure uh, that we have a commitment uh, to geographical, racial, and economic inequities across Massachusetts. The racial ga uh, wealth gap in Massachusetts is absolutely disgraceful. Uh, we have uh, among the most wealthiest here in Massachusetts, but the, the, the economic income gap here is deeply disturbing, one of the highest in the countries. We need to fix that. And so, and the geographical piece is someone that borders uh, Worcester and Middlesex counties. I see those geographical barriers. I know those increase as we go further west. So this is the moment to take action, higher education at all. So inspired to be here with you, as well as my colleagues who are also tremendous leaders on public higher education. Thank you so much. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. This gives me so much hope and joy to see so many familiar faces. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Natalie Higgins, and I'm the state representative in the 4th Worcester District representing the city of Leominster. I am also a former executive director of Phenom, the Public Higher Education Network of Massachusetts. And <laughs> And access to public higher education lifts up communities like mine. And I know that because it did it for my family. I am so thankful for the opportunity that UMass Amherst gave me. My dad didn't have the opportunity to finish college, but they were sure that they were going to do everything in their poss possibility to make sure my brother and I had a shot at going to college. I got my education at UMass Amherst. My brother went to Mass Bay Community College after me. And it opened doors that we can never thank the Commonwealth enough for. But I came to the legislature to make sure that more folks from communities like mine have the opportunity that I did. Because while 50% of Massachusetts residents boast having a bachelor's degree, in my community it's less than a third. In most gateway cities it's less than a quarter have that shot. And we need to make sure that it is more accessible. And that's why I'm so thankful to be teaming up with Rep. Carmen Gentile in the House uh, and, and Senator Jamie Aldridge on our debt-free higher ed bill uh, to make sure that every single resident of the Commonwealth knows that they deserve a good quality, debt-free public higher education. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so honored to be here. I'm really grateful to stand with my incredible colleagues, Rep. Higgins, with whom I am helping to wrang wrangle the higher ed caucus this session. Uh, so we will be back at it, along with Senator Eldridge and our colleagues in the room, uh, to bring together the kind of inside political force necessary to seize the promise of this moment. And I agree, it is time, it is beyond time, and many of you have been leading this work far before I came to the legislature in 2019, and I am so honored to be here. I have, for the last couple of sessions, along with Rep. Garbley, filed the CHERISH Act, um, thanks to Max, who is a good friend, and of course, Dr. Eve Weinbaum. Um, I I, am, I love this bill, and I am so happy to also be in solidarity with the debt-free higher education movement. They are sisters. They are the same, and we are going to find the way forward uh, for both of these critical, critical bills. I want to say the speakers today have been riveting, and uh, I want to thank particularly Claire and Phyllis. Um, who uh, are at UMass Amherst and, of course, Greenfield Community College, because I have the privilege of representing them in the Hampshire Franklin Worcester District. So this session, I chair two committees. I chair the Joint Committee on Public Health, and I chair the COVID-19 and Emergency Preparedness and Management Committee. Uh, that's a lot of words. But what those committees have looked at are the disproportionate ravages of COVID. So I just want to focus in on two things really, really quickly. We know that historically, students of color have been disproportionately boxed out. But when the COVID-19 looked at the higher education implications of the pandemic, and here I will speak to the moral and ethical imperatives of getting this right this session, not only did these historic trends continue, but they increased. So disproportionately fewer students of color entered our educational, higher educational system, and disproportionately more dropped out. I'd say that's a clarion call to action from an equity perspective. And then I want to build on Undersecretary Biolecki's uh, acknowledgement of the economic development reason, right, the pragmatic reason uh, for investing in public higher education. And I want to look for, with you right now at the kids, the students who are in our public higher education uh, systems, because they are wildly disproportionately from Massachusetts. These are our children. 
They will go to our schools. And you know what? They will come home. They come home to our communities. Now, no shade on the private higher education system. They're beautiful campuses, and they do educate some of our children, of our students. But our, the majority, the vast majority of our students will be educated in these fine, stellar public higher education institutions, and then they will come home embracing these 21st century skills that we need them to have. The Commonwealth needs them to have in order to grow our population, our, our economies, and meet the challenges and opportunities, I will say, that lie ahead. So from an equity perspective in one hand and a pragmatic, wildly pragmatic perspective in another, this is a must-pass initiative this session, and I'm really, really so grateful to be with you. Thank you.